I hope everybody is uh, uh, has a chance to see me for a moment. Uh, and uh, I would just like to start this introduction. I have the uh, on behalf of the painting department, at the uh, uh, University of Arts in uh, Poznan. I have the incredible pleasure and honor to welcome uh, Yehuda Safran. Uh, professor I'd known uh, from, which is actually uh, the, the double reason of my, my, uh, of my pleasure uh, uh, today. Uh, professor Yehuda Safran, uh, I had the chance to meet uh, over, over the 27 years ago when I was at the, at the, uh, a student at the Royal College of Art in London, in painting, and uh, I happened to, uh, to stay his students uh, since then. So I still feel very much like a, like a, like a Yehuda student, and I have a great uh, privilege now to pass some of uh, your knowledge uh, in this lecture to my students, uh, who are the painting students at the University of Arts in, in Poznan. And also, I would I would be I'm happy that that I hope this uh, uh, lecture is actually going to initiate the series of talks uh, that I uh, um, um, happen to. Uh, have an idea to, to come to life, uh, which I called, uh, it's a working title called The Sealed Studio Talks. And I very much hope that, that the series of those talks at the time of pandemic solitary confinement, um, we believe that with our effort, the forced physical distance can be reshaped into the advantage of the greater proximity uh, in exchange of ideas. Uh, so, uh, uh, I um, allow myself to say a few words uh, about Yehuda uh, Safran to those who um, may not be uh, surprisingly familiar with, uh, with uh, his figure. Yehuda Safran is an internationally renowned uh, critic of art and architecture. He studied at the St. Martin's uh, School of Art, uh, the Royal College of Art and the University College uh, London. Uh, and the architecture and philosophy, respectively. He has taught at the Architecture Association, Goldsmiths College, London University, Royal College of Art, London, uh, when I had the opportunity and the uh, wonderful uh, pleasure to meet Yehuda, Jan van Eyck Academy, Maastricht, and the GSSPP uh, at Columbia University in New York. He was a fellow uh, of the Chicago Institute of Architecture and Urbanism and visiting professor at the School of Architecture, University of Illinois, as well as at the Rhode Island School of Design, Harvard Graduate School of Design, and uh, the uh, Mendrisio Academy, Ticino. Uh, in recent years, he was a visiting professor at the Nanjing and Tongji Graduate School uh, uh, at Shanghai. He has published, uh, uh, he has pub uh, published a ninth uh, uh, Casabella uh, at Domus, uh, Sight and uh, Sound, and Paris Match, Lotus and H uh, plus U, and uh, AA Files. Uh, Prototypo, Metaculus, Arbitra, The Plan, Springer, Springerine, and Arpress, uh, uh, Inter uh, Alaya, uh, with Stephen Hall and others. He was an editor of 32 uh, Beijing, uh, New York, and among the editors of the Springer Vienna. He is the uh, author of the, uh, of the work about the Mise en Darais. In 2000, he curated Inter Alea, uh, uh, the Arts uh, Council of Great Britain uh, touring exhibition and publication. The architecture of Adolf Laws for the British Arts Council at the ICA London and Cooper Union in New York. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Friedrich Kiesler show uh, at the Architecture Association in London. Uh, in London, recently he's a consultant of Aldo Rossi exhibition at Princeton and curator uh, of the Adolf Laws Our Contemporary uh, exhibition at the CAA uh, uh, at Guimaras, uh, Portugal, at MAC Vienna, Austria, and the GSAPP uh, Columbia University Gallery and Biblioteca Marciana Venice. He was a, a trustee of the Ninth Gallery, a founding member of the Architecture Foundation in London, and a member of the College International the Philosophy in Paris. Currently, he lives and works in New York, where he dedicated, where he directed the Potlatch Journal and the Research Lab at, uh, for the Art and Architecture. Uh, principal contribution to urban workshops in uh, Mumbai slum and issues uh, for of density in Geneva. Advisory board member 
of the first uh, Autostrada Art Biennale at Kosovo and teaches architecture, history, and art theory at Pratt Institute. He has been for the last 22 years consultant to Stephen Hall uh, Architects. We can, uh, of course, uh, go uh, much longer with Yehuda's uh, wonderful cu curriculum, uh, but um, I would like to uh, stop here this short introduction and give the voice to Yehuda Safran. The, the lecture uh, about uh, or uh, related to the, the poem uh, of uh, uh, Francis Ponge, uh, 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 the objects uh, is the poetics. Uh, Yehuda, we all yours, uh, and we welcome you uh, in this uh, uh, immaterial uh, university space. <laughs> so please uh, start. <laughs> well, Dominic, thank you, thank you so much for all the introduction. Uh, it's embarrassing to listen to uh, the list of things that I, am, I have been associated with. It is true that it is a much uh, kind of economized and reduced version. Obviously, the longer one's life is, if it was while, the longer the longer the list is, uh, which means a kind of. Uh, a higher uh, indebtedness to many people and institutions. And indeed, uh, we met, uh, Dominique and I, in the context of uh, the Penny School of uh, <laughs> World Culture of Art, in which I have uh, teaching for uh, some years, not only in the Penny School, but uh, also cultural history, sculpture above all and even architecture uh, uh, you know many people uh, uh, <laughs> i must admit that uh, that even damien harris was one of my students in uh, in goldsmiths but damien harris i see uh, even more seldom than i see dominique <laughs> but every time uh, we meet each other it's uh, it's uh, great fun but I must say that uh, here in this context, I would say that I have a much greater appreciation of the work of Dominique than I have of Damien else. Though as a human being, he's uh, quite nice, very nice, in fact. So, um, you know, uh, this introduction itself could have turned into the entire lecture <laughs> because whatever we can say, whatever we do say, it's uh, never that far from human affairs and the, and the highly complex way in which we entwine uh, each other life. It's not for nothing that uh, there's perhaps no uh, more important artifice in human affair than textile. And textile, as you know, it's nothing but the intertwine of uh, different uh, threads. And this is exactly what I think life is. And so uh, you see, uh, in fact, I was, as you have learned from the introduction, I was also a student at the Royal College of Art. And as a student, I wrote a thesis on, uh, uh, above all, I wrote a thesis on Edmund Husserl. Edmund Husserl was not Polish, but not very far. He was from Moravia. A Jew from Moravia became Protestant. But he, you could say, in a singular fashion, invented what became known as feminology. This feminology of Husserl is unlike the feminology of Hegel of the 19th century, it has only one thing in common, which is the idea of description. The idea that phenomenology is just Greek. And in Greek, it simply means the logic of appearances. So it is the art of describing, in fact, not, like, not unlike paintings <laughs> originally. You, even not originally, even contemporary, painting is describing something. If it doesn't describe something out there, realistically, it describes a feeling, it describes a thought, it describes whatever. Now, phenomenology 
is the logic of appearances, nothing else, nothing more. So in some sense, as a, a Dutch historian already said, said it, Van der Berge, that all painters are born feminologists. <laughs> what did he have in mind saying that? Well, the simple thing is that when a painter is looking at the world, he cannot afford to see it as his predecessor have seen it. He just cannot afford it. He has to somehow emerge from all those ways and put himself in incomparable situation, as if nobody has seen what he is seeing before him. And that is exactly what Husserl in a more formal language called the bracketing, or more technically known as the epoche. Was it epoche? Simply means in Greek, a period. So when you do the period signs, both sides of whatever it is that you are looking at, then you are in the feminologist position. Why? Because you suspend your judgment as if you suspend your belief in the existence of the world at that moment. And what is the outcome? The outcome is it allows you then to see whatever you see in an incomparable way, in a way which has, uh, cannot be compared to anything else, anything before. And that what makes the painter a born phenomenologist. You may not know the world. You may not know anything about it. That doesn't mean that you're not practicing it. Now, knowing, you see, once you are in a, in a school as you are, you don't have the benefit and the privilege of the innocent person. You are no longer innocent. Once you've come to the school, you are no longer, you cannot afford to be the innocent. And I'm not saying that in order to produce art, you have to have any kind of theory. Poetics, the theory of poesis. Poesis is to make. The theory of making is the poetics. Now, you do not have to have a poetics in order to make poetry. But once you're in a school, you are. And if you are, then you might as well uh, consider what it is theoretically to be doing what you're doing. And that's exactly what we are doing right now. We are trying to understand it theoretically. So, I think that Husserl's inspired many, many people. Uh, I didn't want to bother you with uh, visuals, but I do have a photo of, uh, uh, of Kokoschka, incredibly animated discussion with Husserl. And I cannot tell you whether they spoke German or they spoke Czech. I assume that they probably most likely spoke Czech. I mean, the look of them and the smoke that was coming from, from Husserl <laughs> uh, smoking, it was so incredible photo, which even if you don't see it from my description, I hope you get a sense of it. And I mentioned Kokoschka because Kokoschka, as you know, was a, people call him expressionist, but he was, I think, more special than that. He was Kokoschka. And, uh, and Kokoschka, as you know, was a, was a protege of uh, Adolf Loos. Adolf Loos sold his own carpet to pay for the tuition of Kokoschka in the art school. <laughs> <laughs> and then he introduced, he introduced him to Walden, who was the editor of the Experience magazine, you know. And Walden uh, wife was El Elsa Lasker Schiller, a name to remember, one of the greatest poets uh, woman living in Berlin in the 20s, Elsa Lasker Schiller. And Elsa Lasker Schiller made a, a painting for Adolf Loos in which every line starts with another letter from his name, so that if you look at the first letters of all the lines, you get his name, Adolf Loos. And I think it's appropriate to mention him 
for many things, including the thing that uh, he just, uh, we were just celebrating on the 9th of December. Huh? He celebrated 150 years for his birthday. So there you are. You see how the, the, the textile, the texture of human relationship is really the matrix of everything else that you can imagine. Now, this is just on the way to one of the heroes of my uh, discussion today is Francis Ponge. And you see, Francis Ponge, I think, would not be possible without Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And who was Maurice Merleau-Ponty? Maurice Merleau-Ponty was one of the French philosophers to uh, follow in the footstep of uh, Husserl. You know, uh, in Husserl's time, the French philosopher that he was in touch, at least, was uh, Bergson. And though there were some common uh, denominators, especially in the preoccupation with uh, duration and time, nevertheless, the difference bet between them was enormous in the sense that uh, Husserl never, um, Bergson never bothered to read Husserl, and nor did he go to the uh, couple of lectures that Husserl gave at the Sorbonne in the 20s. Husserl gave lectures under the title uh, Cartesian Meditation in honor of Descartes and in honor of the fact that he gave it at the Sorbonne. But uh, as far as we know, Bergson never bothered to go to the lecture or to read him. Nevertheless, uh, the influence of, uh, of uh, also was very great on the next generation uh, of uh, philosophers in France in different ways. You see, uh, um, Jean-Paul Sartre already moved very quickly from Husserl to his students, Heidegger, but Merleau-Ponty remained much more, much closer to Husserl and produced a very empirical version. The most important book is the Phenomenology of Perception. But his importance in this context is double because you could say that the poetry of, uh, uh, of Francis Ponge could never have been written without the phenomenology of, uh, of uh, Merleau-Ponty. And uh, Merleau-Ponty died relatively young uh, by accident, car accident, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, and uh, our poet uh, only died uh, Ponge died only 20 years ago, less, I think. So, and what did Ponge get from this uh, philosophical inspiration? He got the idea that objects, things, are in themselves important, and that is to say, that in so far as we recognize any object in the world, any thing in the world, then these things uh, can teach us. They can help us to return, as Husserl would say, to return to the things themselves. And this return to the things themselves is exemplified by different philosophers and different uh, poets. But above all, in poetry, I think that Ponch is an excellent example, uh, reality of this. And of course, in, in the work of uh, Heidegger, things uh, play uh, an, an important role. And it is strange that uh, Heidegger made the big mistake of uh, joining the Nazis in the early 30s even after the coup of 1933, not only he joined them, 
but he became the director of Freiburg University when uh, Husserl, who was already in uh, uh, was, uh, already a pensioner, lost all his privileges because of his uh, Jewish origin. And the people who saved him were the Catholic University in Lovan. And it is also interesting why Catholic, and I'll give you immediately the explanation, because you see, originally, Husserl started his life as a mathematician. And as a mathematician, he wrote a thesis on uh, the origin of numbers, by which he meant already origin not in the geographic or historical sense, but in the conceptual sense. And, you know, in those years, in the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, you could not write a thesis, a PhD thesis, and get your professor and his friends to review it. And There is a... I can't hear him. There is, yes, there is a break in the link. Can you hear him, Dominic? I can't oh. hear him. No, no, it, 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 it's just a still frame now. Oh my God. Can, can you tell him? Look, how? I don't know. Say, Yehuda, it's not working. I can call him. Do you want me to call it's him? It's not working. Yes, maybe. Uh, I, I'll oh, call Pavle. him. Mama I'll Pavle. call him. Call him on the phone. I asked my assistant because okay. there's no the technical. Okay. I can hear you. Working. It's all fine. Not to worry. It was okay. 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 So go back. So I was just, Maybe I was just at the critical point. Once again. Uh, I, it's, okay. It's, it's okay. All is well. Okay. Good. 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 We got you. Yeah, we got you back. Yeah. So I was just telling you. We were just at the, po at the point where, um, you see, I was telling you that Husserl wrote his thesis on the origin of number. And at that time, you could not just get your thesis, PhD thesis read by your professor and some of your, your his friends. In European universities, until the early 20th century, a PhD thesis had to be published so anybody could read it and anybody could criticize it. And also it was very lucky because among the people who read it was a great philosopher of mathematics called Frege. And Frege took the trouble to write a review, a review of Husserl's thesis. And Frege's point was that uh, Husserl misunderstood the conceptual character of numbers. And he presented numbers far too psychologically and did not make allowances for the fact that number above all are conceptual entities. And Husserl rightly, you know, by the way, um, Frege was the one to whom Wittgenstein went after he had the troubles of designing the aeronautics things in Bristol with foundation of mathematics. Being a Wittgenstein was like being a Morgan in New York. So he went to the best authority and he, he went to um, Frege. And Frege advised him that if these were his interests, then he should uh, go to Cambridge and study with Russell. Well, the same Frege uh, inspired in the, in the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, inspired Husserl to go back to school. What did it mean to go back to school for um, Husserl? Interestingly enough, for him, it meant to go and study with Clement Brentano, 
in Vienna. Why Clement Brentano and why Vienna? Well, very interesting, because Brentano was German, but deeply Catholic philosopher. And just at the time, I'm talking about 1890s, you know, the Pope decided to increase the number of dogmas in order to reinforce the authority of the papal authority in face of a growing democratic rights for people. And what were the, 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 the new dogma? One, first of all, very importantly, was the infallibility of the Pope. Second was the Immaculate Conception. Uh, you could say that, uh, that Brentano was more Catholic than the Pope and <laughs> objected to these uh, new uh, dogmas, which meant that he couldn't teach in a Catholic university in Germany. And so he left his position and went to Vienna, not that Vienna was less Catholic, but in Vienna the university, or at least for the time being, was relatively free, and they did employ him. And he gave a, a seminar that drew many interesting people, not only Husserl was drawn to his seminar, but also Freud, though Freud and Husserl, as far as I know, never met. And what was so unique about Brentano? Brentano was teaching almost medieval kind of philosophy concerning the theory of intentionality. Well, there is no philosophy without uh, a theory of intentionality. But what was particularly interesting about Brentano was his type of intentionality was was really uh, uh, a re-kind of regurgitated version of medieval uh, teaching, which made it extremely attractive for Catholics. And this is the reason, I believe, why phenomenology spread, first of all, so much in Catholic countries and also belatedly in uh, the Anglo-Saxon world. The Anglo-Saxon world did not uh, went for it. On the contrary, if the Catholics in America, if you look at the, who published books in phenomenology in America, you will see the Catholic University, Northwestern, Rotterdam, Loyola, etc., etc. And indeed, uh, phenomenology played a very important role in France, precisely not because uh, Merleau-Ponty or Sartre were particularly Catholics, but they couldn't help it. They were part of that culture, which accommodate uh, that version of philosophy much more than the Anglo-Saxon. Be that this as it may, it is important to note that Heidegger completely changed uh, the main uh, thesis of phenomenology insofar as Husserl was in search of what is true anytime, anywhere. In other words, the essential. He was asking about the essential, whereas a, um, Heidegger is doing exactly the opposite. He asks more about existence than essentials. And therefore, for him, temporality largely consists in historical categories. And he's not even ashamed, if you look at the being in time, his most important work, if you look at the index under Marx, you will find that he is prepared to give the authority on interpretation of history to no less than Karl Marx himself. Well, that's a very different conception of temporality uh, and uh, consciousness than, than the one that, uh, that uh, 
uh, Husserl developed. But it will allow you perhaps to understand better the point about things and the point about the belief that things can actually allow you, as it were, a familiarity of uh, things in themselves, things as they are. And uh, this is where uh, the poem of, uh, um, of uh, Ponch has, uh, in my view, is, uh, plays such an important role. You know, the title of the poem is, is The Object is the Poetics. Now, this is the quote from a painter, from Braque. As you know, Braque uh, and Picasso together developed on the summer holiday in 1908-09, they developed what became known as Cubism. It was not, they didn't call it Cubism. The name Cubism came later on by a friend of uh, Picasso was Apollinaire, the Italian poet, and he called it Cubism. But the important thing about this quote, Braque, the object is the poetics. You see, I don't know about you, but when I was a little boy, I, <laughs> I thought to myself, well, everything is discovered already, everything is done, so what shall I do? It took me a while to realize that uh, it was not the case. <laughs> well, well, whatever is known is only, uh, or as Newton once put it, human knowledge is like a, a drop in the ocean. So if for him human knowledge was a drop in the ocean, what would it be for the average human being? Even less than a drop, I imagine. Anyhow, the point is, you know, the word object is not very different from the word thing, or in German, ding. The difference is that in the word object, which is the Latin root, you have two words. The word object is made of ob and jacked. And ob is, means against, and jacked is to throw. So it already means to throw against, which is exactly figure on ground. So you have already the idea of the, of the thing in it. Uh, the, the word thing in itself, of course, also in all Germanic languages and so on, means a gathering, something of a gathering. So it's another way of um, understanding object. And the poetics, of course, as I already mentioned, the poetics come from the Greek word poesis, which means to make. So poetics is a theory of making, whether you need it or not. And then one of the contribution of Ponch is to realize the fact that as human beings, we do not have the center of gravity in ourselves. We have the center of gravity always, always outside ourselves. And this is one of the reasons why we keep arranging things around us. We keep arranging things around us in order to keep that balance, in order to make sure that we can experience or think something in our interior. We do need something outside to be the equivalent of it. As he says, we do not have the center of gravity in ourselves. That is a very beautiful way of, of saying it. He says, yeah, man is a queer sort of body who has no center of gravity in himself. Our feeling is transitive. It needs an object which affects us, affects it, as its direct complement at once. 
It is a question of the gravest relation, not at all of having, but of being. The artist, more than anyone else, bears the brunt of it, acknowledges the blow. Well, I think that is a great insight. Uh, you know, the Dutch Japanese are famous for their indulgence in uh, flower arrangements. Well, it doesn't surprise me. After all, in flower arrangement, you can establish that kind of object-like relationship, uh, which is he very helpful to feel one way or the other, to think one way or the other. I mean, one of my great love in the cinema is Ozu, and in Ozu films you can see how these things which are on the, on the, on the table, which things around, how they shape the atmosphere and they determine exactly your ability to understand, to imagine, to detect even uh, what the different characters feel in, the, in themselves feel in themselves. So that is, I think, a very important insight. But I must say that uh, Heidegger, in spite of being such a, um, so awful at a certain point, <laughs> he, you know that he became the rector, but by the end of the year, he realized that uh, that the Nazis were actually pretty um, unprincipled, that they were opportunistic. It was perfectly true. If you had enough money to pay for your life, they will let you go. <laughs> so this opportunism of the Nazis made him resign. And once he resigned, he wrote this incredible piece, again, origin, you know, except that in German, of course, the word origin, although it comes from Orient, it comes from where the sun comes from. But in German, you don't use the word origin, you use the word Ursprung, which means a kind of uh, Sprung is a, is a spring is a, is a source of the water, you know, sprung. Uh, U is a very, very early, the earliest source, you could say, Ursprung. But even in that Ursprung that he uses, uh, it's not that far from the way that Husserl used the word origin in the conceptual sense. And Husserl used it again at the end of his life when he wrote this origin of geometry, an amazing short piece that he wrote at the end of his life, which was absolutely the opposite of Poincaré. You know, Poincaré was the greatest mathematician and physicist in France in the early 20th century. And Poincaré was one of those people who believed that, uh, that Euclidean geometry had a priority for its simplicity and economy, and no matter what, non-Euclidean geometry will come up, Euclidean geometry will hold its uh, place. Well, Husserl did not think so, on the contrary. You know, Husserl in that uh, famous piece uh, suggested the opposite, it suggested there will be other geometries, and so sure enough, these geometries might have a great advantage over uh, earlier version, whether it was Euclidean or uh, the non-Euclidean uh, geometries uh, of people like uh, Riemann uh, and others. By the way, this was the first translation and publication of, uh, of the Rida in philosophy, but the translation of that relatively short essay with three times as long introduction. And I think the introduction is so long because I'm not so sure that the Rida genuinely understood what Husserl had in mind, because Husserl had originally uh, was a mathematician, 
and uh, Derrida was never even close to anything mathematical. Uh, so I suspect, I suspect that the, uh, the, the terribly long uh, introduction suggests the lack of comprehension. But let it be as it is, let's uh, focus on the connection with this uh, poem of Ponge. It occurred to me that the thing that you need to look up, which is worth looking it up, is indeed a Heidegger piece on the origin of work of art, which was conceived and first given in 1935, meaning just after uh, Heidegger resigned from the Freiburg rectorship, he wrote that piece, which is very interesting. And in that piece, he uh, refer, among other things, to the, one of the most important conception of uh, of art in relation to truth and the idea of truth as being as it is understood in the Greek language, aletia, aletia, a l e t t e i a. Letia means covered, and aletia means uncovered. And you can see in the classical iconology of uh, uh, European art, you see again and again, the figure of truth is a beautiful woman, half naked, always on the way to be uncovered. Truth ultimately supposed to be uncovered, but in the meantime, it never is. <laughs> Certainly not completely. For example, in Bernini's sculpture in the in the garden in Rome, you can see that sculpture is exactly like that in a very straightforward terms. So uh, Heidegger, in fact present to us on three occasions, in poetry, in architecture, the Greek temple, and in painting. And what does he do in painting? In painting, he referred to the famous, one of the eight or so painting of Van Gogh of shoes. And in that uh, painting of Van Gogh, uh, Heidegger suggests to us these shoes as the shoes of a peasant. But among the people who read this uh, piece when it first published after 1935 was a great uh, art historian in New York called Maya Shapira. And Maya Shapira wrote an article, The Still Life as a Personal Object, a note on Heidegger and Van Gogh. And in that piece, he argued, first of all, he does something very beautiful, and he brings a quote from, uh, from Hunger, his great book by, uh, by um, Knut Hampson. And he uh, quote Knut Hampson as Knut Hampson in Hunger described his own shoes. Well, it doesn't matter. You can read it yourself. <laughs> And then he goes on to show us that he did write to, uh, to, as he referred to him, Professor Heidegger, in reply to my question, Heidegger has kindly written me that the picture in which he referred is one that he saw in the show at Amsterdam in March 1930. Well, then Shapiro says, well, in that case, 
This is the shoes, not of a peasant, but of Van Gogh himself. And so, uh, uh, there was a, clearly, a proof given by Shapira that the shoes were not really the peasant shoes, but they were, in fact, Van Gogh shoes himself. And then, a few hours later, and this is where the Rida returned to our story, the Rida wrote a book in which one of the chapter is called Truth in Paintings. And in that article, the Rida was trying to play the ampere between uh, Heidegger and Shapira. And the Rida suggested that the shoes are neither uh, the peasant nor Van Gogh on shoes. The shoes are the painted shoes. And therefore, as the painted shoes, they have their own statue in reality, as it were, or non-reality. A few years later, I was asked to write about the, <coughs> about the, the American uh, New York painters that went under the title of the sublime, Barnett Newman, Rotko, Clifford Steele, and uh, Olitsky. And among the other things that I suggested in that uh, text, including the fact that they're sublime, related more to the fact that as children they read the Old Testament in King James's version aloud rather than 18th century as Barnett Human tried to create the impression. For in that context of that sublime, I suggested that the shoes indeed are neither Van Gogh nor the peasant. The shoes are Moses' shoes in front of the burning bush in the Old Testament story. You remember of Moses running up from Pharaoh palace as he just killed one of the mason uh, guards who was attacking a mason and to escape punishment he ran to the desert and in the desert he's faced with a burning bush and he hear the voice tell you take your shoes off your feet because uh, you are standing on a holy place whatever that means <laughs> and so i suggested that that the shoes in Van Gogh paintings are Moses' shoes. Well, I think I will end here so that it give you plenty of time to ask questions and to elaborate on what you really want to understand rather than me going on. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, uh, Dominique, can I ask a question? Yes. You can hear me, right, Yehuda? Yes. yes, yes. Okay, uh, the question, I was fascinated by uh, your discussion, which was partly etymological as well as phenomenological and philosophical about the difference in meaning between das Ding, the thing, and the objectum, the object. And you mentioned the object as the thing which is thrown against, and then you mentioned figure ground, which I found very persuasive. But I, I was reminded when you spoke of das Ding, of the thing, of what Jacques Lacan said when he spoke of the thing in the Indo-Germanic, Indo-European sense of das Ding, the, ger the ancient meaning of, uh, in, in ger German and the Proto-Germanic, which is a thing which haunts you, a thing which does not go away. And he quotes Shakespeare, I believe, Lacan, he says at the beginning of Hamlet, that thing, has it appeared again tonight about the ghost of Hamlet's father? That thing. Uh, do you think that there is a element of the haunting in the thing? Which, uh, say the work of art is always present even when it's not present, that type of thing. It haunts you. Yeah. So Lacan yeah, was wrong. 
Yeah, I think there's no doubt, in my mind at least, that uh, whatever version of the thing includes such a, a haunting, even though in some languages, for example, in ancient, not only in ancient, but already in ancient Hebrew, the thing is the thing that one says, you know, mm. the word. Le, le the word and thing. Yes, the word and thing is the same word. The, the, the bar. Sanskrit, you find similar connection between the sound. Because ultimately, you could say that all art is language in some sense. Language, not in the kind of communicative sense at all, but in the most important aspect of the language is not the communicative, it's that which create a thing, of, a thing of nothing. <laughs> and the thing of nothing, of course, includes also the, <laughs> the most terrible possible things that we imagine. That haunting. We, uh, in fear of, right, the things that are haunting necessarily are part of that. Uh, und ich, ich habe einen kleinen Anhang, a tiny appendix. You mentioned that, and I thought that was very interesting, even a brilliant move, where you say the thing is also the collectivity. And the right. oldest, uh, one of the oldest parliaments in the world, the collective body, is in Iceland, and it's called the Althing, the all thing. Exactly, the all thing, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that idea also you find in all Germanic tribes. Uh, so that's like the state as a work of art in a way. Exactly. And Heidegger is very clever. He doesn't uh, draw out this connection. I know why. He doesn't draw out this connection, not because he is not familiar or doesn't know. On the contrary, he knows only too well. And he doesn't ah, want, he does not to, want to confuse <laughs> this course with this ancient discourse. Therefore, he doesn't mention it. Th he thank you. <laughs> Th thank you. Yeah, that was his, 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 his habit. Thank you, Yehuda. <laughs> by the way, he only got to Greece when it was <laughs> occupied by the Germans, not before. Ach du Liebe. Not even late. You consider his work, which was already mm. published in the 20s. Yeah. Uh, Huda, first of all, you know, you uh, <clears throat> did uh, dig into my mind and brought introduction to my first book and a uh, very brilliant piece. And I wonder, <clears throat> just a quick question, you know, how do you think this deep mining, mining of philosophy is affecting what we do as architects and artists? Well, as I, you know, as I, um, as I said in my uh, own introduction, um, that you don't need to know phenomenology to act as a phenomenologist. <laughs> so, but, <laughs> But 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 Sorry, of course, no. <laughs> but when you know, right? But when you know, you can do it even more so. You know, that that's my. I, I apologize to interrupt, but you know, I lost my sense for phenomenology a long time ago. You know, and uh, I just do not understand people who pursue it. I'm interested. <laughs> I just want to know what you think. Well. I I think that most, unfortunately, in art, in the, in the context of art and architecture, I had too many people talk about phenomenology in a kind of, uh, unset, un, in a way which is not satisfying to me, not that I have an, the ultimate authority, but take a good example. For example, in, in uh, cinema and architecture, we had our friends in Finland, you know, uh, who wrote a good book on uh, cinema and architecture. Um, you know who I mean? Palaspa. Johannes Palaspa. Palaspa, Johannes yeah. Palaspa. Very nice and very uh, nice man. And he wrote a book 
which is supposedly phrenological approach called uh, Eyes in the Skin. Mm. Now, I wouldn't recommend the book, not because it's a bad book, it's a good book, but somehow it simplifies many issues that are far more complex. It's a kind of Maurice Merleau-Ponty for children, you could, you could call it for youth. <laughs> and and I, I don't blame you if you found the, the so-called phenomenological blah, blah, blah um, uh, unappealing. I mean, the famous example we have in New York is Mr. Uh, what's his name? Mr. Peter Eisenman, you know, who <laughs> goes around and talking about the conceptualist versus the phenomenologist, right? So he's the conceptualist. He, he knows too little to appreciate that his great uh, guru, Mr. Uh, Derrida, is nothing but a footnote to so himself. <laughs> and all phenomenology, insofar it is phenomenology, start with the conceptual analysis. Mm -hmm. So there is no such dichotomy between the conceptual and the phenomenological. Yeah, because but you could would have, you would have just, just apologized to interrupt. You know, I love you. You know, uh, you're my friend. And uh, I just think that. Um, that I, I just want to know what you think about, you know, arriving at the stage of uh, looking for knowledge, especially artificial knowledge today, and uh, there is no phenomenon associated with it, and uh, at least not that I know. And uh, so that's something I would like you to address. Well, when you say not phenomena, uh... Uh, associated with it, I understand what you mean, and indeed, in the in the purest uh, uh, version of, of science, uh, you could say that there are no phenomena; they are only creatures uh, of our own mind, and that doesn't mean that uh, <laughs> that the the, the the conceptual discourse of uh, phenomenological speaking could not apply. It does apply, and you find it among uh, biologists. Uh, among physicists, you do find a phenomenological uh, discourse sometimes uh, very good. Mm. Um, yes. For example, this uh, neuroscientist who used to be in Colombia, what's his name, wrote this incredible book uh, called... The uh, Man Who Took His Wife for a Hat. No, no, that, The Sky. The, no. The, you know, you met... Oh, you Edelman. Met Edelman. 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 Edelman, who got Nobel Prize for his work in... Uh, in neuroscience, well, read his book. It's full of phenomenology. G Gerald Edelman. Yeah. Imagine he got Nobel Prize for immunology, not neuroscience. Oh, immunology. I, I, immunology. <laughs> he got a Nobel Prize not for neuroscience, but for immuno immunology. You know? And then you know? from immunology, he went to the brain, uh, he said. Right, right. Yeah. Right. He said that right. knowledge so in a certain... You, yeah. You, you read his, right. If you read his book, it's full of phenomenological insights. Also Hermann so, Weil, Yehuda. I, right. So I think, so while I, I sympathize with your reaction, um, Surgeon, mm -hmm. I think that uh, one should not allow the impression of bad things to uh, hide, to, to mask. Mm. A very important and good things, and that's what I would say about phenomenology in contemporary discourse, right? Mm. For me, it's always a question that I posed in the title of the text I've written for you, you know, what does a man know when he knows the language? <laughs> uh, to respond to that, uh, thank you, Dominic, for allowing this. Um, I just, at this moment, I, I don't, you know, I actually, I have an anecdote to say. I mean, I ordered the, you know, phenomenology book for my landlord, who is 80. Which, which phenomenology book? Well, um, the, the whatever, the reader on phenomenology. And, uh, and, and it's something that, that I, I would like to ask you a question. You know, does it come with age? I mean, I know Palasma and I know what he's doing. I know friends who are totally influenced by him, but 
does it come with age? Does it come with age? Age or age? Yeah. Age. You mean, you mean the older age, you are, the more... Meaning like, exactly. You mean the older you are, the more you're inclined to uh, follow it? That's correct. That's my question. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, in my view, not at all. I think that I, I agree with uh, Van der Berge, who was a kind of psychological, uh, historical uh, psychologist in Holland, who coined this phrase, you know, he, the phrase he coined was, um, how did he say it? Old painters are born feminologists. <laughs> so, not with age, you are born feminologists. And you might not know it. <laughs> you might not know that it's called feminology, you know, like, like the Moliere character who, who made some money, so he got himself a, he got himself a tutor who taught him the difference between poetry and... Um, all my life I spoke pro uh, prose and I didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look, I work with artists, as you know, like Jenny Holzer and Robert Wilson, and they are not phenomenologists. They're <laughs> simply pragmatic. How do you know? Yeah, but <laughs> Because just... I work with them. If you know, <laughs> no, it has to do with working with them. If you know the phenology that I know, you would be able to see that what they're doing is phenomenological, but they don't call it phenomenology. That's, they don't need to. But maybe, uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm uh, you can hear me, Yehuda? Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. This is just something about yeah. the, what just surgeon was saying. And yeah. my, my, uh, my superficial mind, uh, allows me to uh, to have a question which is that you, Susan, you didn't mention painters you just mentioned artists and i think there is this huge difference mm. I, I think i think i even think that painters may not be considered as artists anymore uh, <laughs> and i do believe that they are born phenomenologists phenomolo phenomolo also uh, on, on the same basis uh, with the relation to art as, as painters are uh, somehow uh, dealing with what I would say, uh, quoting Friedrich Kiesler, which you, of course, are most familiar with, that art is uh, that art is a teaching of resistance. So, speaking of the gravity that you mentioned in Ponch's uh, poem, the artists are somehow resisting being an artist. The painters actually somehow, throughout what they do, they they resist being an artist. Because what the painting is now, I think is something completely different than art in general. And I would like to know Why your you opinion. Said, would, you, would you consider be, being art, uh, painters and artists anymore? Maybe they are not artists. Maybe Sergeant mentioned uh, just artists, but, but it doesn't mean that, that uh, painters are not phenomenologists because they are not artists anymore. <laughs> okay, well, I understand that threw a bomb into the discussion. That's why we have this discussion. I do not know. I'm not a painter myself. And actually, I never work with a painter. Uh, I work with other contemporary artists. And, um, yeah, because and I this can is share my experience. Yeah. No, because this is something very important. I would like to, to ask Yehuda uh, about, about that. The, the, because this deals with the, this, this uh, the phenomena of, of the, the shoes. Uh, of Van Gogh's shoes, uh, and, and it's gravity because of uh, be, because they are they are the painted shoes. So how how come does this relate to the 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 how would say the gravity as an aspect of resistance in a way? I mean I, I would say that that this is a different type of resistance if you're a painter, then you're like an uh, artist, which I would say has some reference, maybe again, it's, 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 a, it's, it's sort of a, uh, it may sound like a manifesto, but I would say, I would consider all, all other arts that are not painters as much more ideological. So phenomenology and ideology, is, this is something which I would like to ask about. Because I, it's like quoting Baudelaire that sculpture is something that I can fell over because when I step back to look at the painting. So for me, that, that there is this difference, I would say, uh, when you say artists uh, and when you say painters. 
I don't know. It, it, it's 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 just it's just this thing that I, I I thought I could I could ask Yehuda also whether you would whether you would consider the painters an artist anymore. Uh. What 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 I would say is that uh, that normally we would use the category of paintings to apply to to people who are doing art without being a painter in a technical sense at all. You know. Uh, I mean, I, I even consider a great artists like Marcel Boudrat, he was never a painter. And, he, and all what he did was not as a painter, but as mm. a, a great artist, he was a poet. I think that all art actually uh, wants to be like poetry, in fact. Mm. And in some sense is a kind of poetry. So I don't think that we need to make uh, categorical uh, distinction, but we have to recognize that the uh, modus operandi, the way that different artists actually are working can be very, very, very different. So different that you might be difficult to include them in one category or another all, all together. But I would say that one of the things that I find very much in common between many architects, artists, and writers is the desire to defy gravity, you know. Mm -hmm. It's funny because gravity is exactly what science itself doesn't really know, you know. We can calculate uh, you, the action you, from a distance. You would and how, then... action from a distance, how action from a distance is possible, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. So it's not that only in art we, we are working in a rather dark territories. I think as human beings, we are no better than the virus that killed us. We are also like a virus, you know, we just <laughs> kind of uh, swimming around and trying to do this and that. But do we know anything? I don't think so. Not, mm -hmm. not I don't know. I think that the species, we don't. Yeah, hi. The species, we are very limited. I've been listening. Yehuda, can you hear me? Them. It's yeah. Mark Isborn in Berlin. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to, you to talk a little bit more. You uh, brushed over in uh, Ponti somewhat, a primarily because he wrote extensively about painting, perhaps more than any other phenomenologist. Yeah. And secondly, yeah. you didn't really touch upon or fill out the notion of the embodied and the concept of flesh, what he calls the concept of flesh, although even that wasn't worked out at the time of his death in 1961. So perhaps you could say something about... Uh, the embodied aspect of phenomenology, which is something that it seems to me differentiates him greatly from Husserl, because he cited everything within the body. I know there is a forebear, Schopenhauer talked about embodying, you know, one can only know one's own body, but in a very different context. But um, perhaps you'd say something on that. Well, you, you, ad you addressed your question just to the right person, I think, because I wrote my thesis in 1972 on embodiment and empathy. And indeed, one of my main uh, source of inspiration for that thesis was Maurice Merleau-Ponty. You know, I didn't extend uh, my, uh, in my talk, I didn't extend uh, further on, on Merleau-Ponty just because I had so many other <laughs> uh, markers in, in that uh, uh, talk, uh, but not because uh, I lack appreciation uh, or knowledge of Meloponti. I think you're absolutely right. Embodiment is a very important issue in, uh, in his work. And then, you know, I also studied uh, uh, a woman who is uh, far less known, but very important, who was both secretary and assistant to Husserl, which is Ed Edith Stein who wrote a thesis uh, with Husserl on empathy because uh, Husserl believed that empathy was uh, not just in relationship, uh, a normal relationship with one person to another, but it was a key in his mind to overcome solipsism. That the only way that, uh, that you could imagine some uh, knowledge, some idea of somebody else's mind was uh, through empathy. And so I thought that these issues of empathy and uh, 
embodiment are very close together and need to be studied together. And this is exactly what I did in my thesis of 1972. <laughs> Uh, I studied them together. And I must say that at the time, neither of these concepts was very, very much in vogue. I mean, nobody was talking about it. You know, if you mentioned embodiment in 1970 in an English art school, uh, people would think that you are from the moon or somewhere. You know, I have no idea. Nobody talks but, about but, it. Nobody read Merleau Ponty, <laughs> except I did. <laughs> But uh, Yehuda Gombrich was talking about empathy back then, but he didn't understand it. Well, he didn't. I know he talked about empathy, but not, in, not at all in that uh, philosophical perspective. Right, right. You know. Yeah. yeah. That only reinforced Empathy always played a role in, a, in aesthetic uh, theory. The, there was a discussion of empathy, and that's how I got to it. But it was never really very well developed. Before Edith Stein, and fortunately, you know, at the time Edith Stein, there was only her thesis was published in uh, Martinus Nyhoff, this academic publication house in in Holland, and the only thing that was published by her was this book on empathy. It's called on empathy. But then, the Polish Pope, as we are in Poznan, the <laughs> Polish Pope. Uh, <laughs> actually made Edith Stein a saint. Yes. You see, because Edith Stein originally was a Polish woman, uh, a Jewish Polish woman, uh, very much the same story as, uh, as uh, Luxembourg, you know, very much as Luxembourg. And uh, uh, except that Luxembourg was Marxist and Edith Stein went to study with Husserl. And, uh, and her study with Husserl and her thesis and so on, led her to become Catholic. And as a Catholic, she became a nun. And as a nun, she moved to a, uh, 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 to a convent in Holland. And in that convent, the German found her uh, when they occupied Holland, and they sent her to Auschwitz. And Pope Bortila, made her into a saint. And the good thing he did, because once she became a saint, you could find all her writings were published, especially in French and Italian. I don't know how it is in Poland. Probably also, yeah. Right? Yeah. In my view, she is still the greatest. You know that about 20 years ago, there was a huge development, scientific, you know, some physiologists in Italy, in Parma, discovered that when they gave these wonderful nuts to one group of uh, chimpanzee, <laughs> the other group behaved as if they had the pleasure of eating this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so the Italian noticed it and they decided to inquire, how come, what is it? What makes the people, the, the chimpanzee who didn't have the nuts feel so happy when they saw their friends chimpanzee eating their favorite nuts. <laughs> and then they discovered what they claim to be called the, the neuron, mirror neuron. In other words, neurological behavior that mirror like uh, external events. Mm -hmm. And this uh, they uh, connected with the phenomenon mm -hmm. of empathy. Mm -hmm. And they thought that this mirror uh, neurons explain the phenomenon of empathy. And it's so interesting that uh, even though these discoveries, uh, if we take them at face value, uh, important as they are, strangely enough, in my view, they don't add anything to our understanding of empathy. Mm. I mean, the fact that we now know there is some physiology, physiological basis mm. doesn't really explain empathy, hmm. or not as well as Eddie Stein did so, many, so you, many years ago. You know, Yehuda, from the 16th century to the 19th century, uh, painters were compared to monkeys. There's a brilliant book about that called Le Singe Antiquaire, The Antiquary Monkey, by Jean Sesnec. Well, of course it was. Yeah. 
So the most important phenomenon in human life is mimicry. Mimicry. You know, mimicry. Mimicry is colossal. Colossal. It's very difficult to imagine human life without a large dose of mimicry. Mm. And th this is why mimesis is so important, you know. Mm. And our French uh, friend who wrote this book on mimesis is absolutely hilarious. Mm. Are oh, you talking about uh, Gérard Genette? Yeah, the voyage, the the pays oh, de Cratelli, mimologique, mimologique. Mimologique is a great book. Precisely yeah. why? Because mimicry is an enormous uh, part of our life, mm. whether we know it or not. <laughs> uh, just to add, Yehuda, um, well, it's very beautiful what you're saying. I just you know, as my friend, I always want to say I never saw you as a phenomenologist. <laughs> I saw you as somebody interested in phenomenology. Well, thank you, thank you. I, know, <laughs> to know I never, know. I never, you're absolutely right, because I never like yeah. to give myself, uh, you know, tickets. I remember my students at the Royal College of Art, not in the penny school so much, in other school where I was teaching the Royal College of Art. I, I know that. I mean, <laughs> They would ask me, Yehuda, what are you? You're not Freudian. No, I'm not. Yeah, <laughs> you're not Marxist. I just no, wanna, I'm not. You're not. I just so what are you? I said, I said, I'm sorry. I am who I am. <laughs> I just want to have an input on empathy. And, um, you know, I, I have been in dialogue with many friends who are falling down to phenomenology and empathy and those issues about feeling the space and feeling blah 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 you know like especially in architecture especially you know turning to be religious and spiritual mm. so what do you think about that i mean is is the entire discourse turning towards that no i i think that uh, anything worthwhile that human being uh, invent or achieve can easily uh, drag into the mud, can easily become something else, you know. And uh, what you are telling us about is uh, un unfortunate people who know too little to, uh, they don't know, you know, it's not that they don't know this and that, they don't know themselves. That is the problem. <laughs> so anything can, can put them into a, a very narrow strait. That is unfortunate. <laughs> And I think the only way to repair it is not necessarily by knowing other things. No, this can help or not. The most important thing is to know thyself. This is what uh, Husserl himself uh, always be, uh, taught us this. He said, in the end of you, if you read the most succinct version of his philosophy, you will find in a relatively slim book, which is called Cartesian meditation, which uh, which he uh, uh, published as the uh, record of his lectures at the Sorbonne, and in the end he he says exactly that. He repeat the Socratic maxim, you know, know thyself, know thyself, and he for himself always claimed that his real ambition was to become an absolute beginner, you know, mm. semper initiare, always in the beginning. Yehuda, does, so he, does, he, does he quote Montaigne as well as Descartes? No, no. But that's curious, he that doesn't. absence. That's curious, that lacuna, because yes, we're in... No, because, you know, uh, Montaigne is, strictly speaking, uh, more, belong more to kind of humanist tradition than mm. uh, philosophy as such, because he was not uh, purely a philosopher in the sense that he embraced a much larger kind of... Uh, yeah. Canvas, you could say. <laughs> yeah, but that's still a skeptical uh, Stoic tradition. There was he's been classified yeah. best, wet, better, see, or worse, a skeptical see, Stoic. Uh, yeah, uh, but you see, also essentially, it was more kind of technical. You see, he came from yeah. mathematics, not mathematics, from history yeah. or literature or uh, right. study of activity. You know, he came from right. mathematics. Um, right. I think what is amazing about him that he came from mathematics, and yet there is much which is uh, an echo of uh, humanistic uh, tradition mm. in his writing. For example, in the end of this book, he, 
he quotes Socrates. He's uh, no, no less. Well, says, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. No, no, no thyself, you know. But Montaigne so is a bit far saying, afield. Yeah. Exactly. Yehuda, another question, okay? Maybe another bombshell. I mean, I have a degree in mathematics before. Yes, I know. As you know, yeah. So uh, there are no emotions I was in mathematics. I was happy There's to no know. empathy. <laughs> so, but it's the internal truth. So uh, how do you deal with that? I mean, introducing empathy, introducing things that are close to spirituality. I mean, I just want to know what you think about it. Well, I I always remember what uh, um, what uh, Einstein said about mathematics in his lecture to the uh, Science Academy of Russia in the twenties. He said, "In so far as it is true, talking about mathematics, it's not about reality. In so far <laughs> it is about reality, it's not true." <laughs> 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 so, you know, I think, you know, if I had a, a, another choice of life, if somebody said to me, listen, here you are, you, you, uh, you dice, you start rolling again from, from zero. Which way would you like it? I, I would say, give me mathematics, you know, <laughs> let me out of this mess. <laughs> <laughs> but but Yehuda, mathematics is also a mess in a certain way. They have I there's thought, no, no, no but, you know but when I was no, a no high school consensus. Student, I was very I was very good uh, about algebra. You know, I did algebra <laughs> like I was a real Arabic uh, uh, scholar. You know, I, I would <laughs> solve algebraic <laughs> issues very easily and very correctly. You know. And my teacher thought, well, you know, you're doing it so well. Why don't you kind of make it your, into your main thing? But I must say that I spend more time reading uh, psychology books under the table. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but Yehuda, I was, re I was reading about I the... Algebra, you know, I thought algebra was too easy. <laughs> <laughs> but you and I was reading about the fundamental disputes between the in mathematics between the intuitionists, the formalists, the Platonists. The they're they're all about fundamental. They're fighting like cats and dogs. Daniel, Daniel, I'm familiar with exactly what you're referring to. But don't forget, this discussion no longer exists. You know why? Because nobody cares anymore. Really? That's yeah. That's in def, in reference to surgeon. Uh, you know, in mathematics, people no longer think in these terms, which in art sometimes people still refer to, like, you know, intuitionist, uh, structuralist, uh, formalist, uh, formalist, etc., etc. It, it no longer doesn't apply. It used to apply to mathematics just like as in art, but it no longer applies because... It's part of the history the mathematics, of mathematics. mathematics. Exactly. The mathematician, mathematician themselves no longer think in these terms at all. Right, right. But yeah. I'm a historian, Yehuda, and the historians of mathematics talk about it. Yes, it was <laughs> an important chapter, you know. Right. Certainly before the Second World War. Uh, Indeed. Uh, Hilbert, uh, David Hilbert. Were divided, you know, mathematicians were divided like... Uh, like uh, like artists, you know, between the intuitionists, the, po the, the, Pol the Polish etc. school of mathematicians. And I can tell you well, I can say right. something about this. I can say Go something. Go for it, Danny, Dominic. Daniele, uh, uh, the uh, uh, father of my of my wife, uh, he's a mathematician from Poznan. And uh, he uh, just uh, signed up for the course of a, for a driving license. <laughs> so they go into the car and he drives. And he, his instructor uh, says to him, what are you doing? Think, think. <laughs> <laughs> That's phenomenological without knowing. <laughs> Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> can, can I tell a very no, brief... Sorry, it is not phenomenological. It is no, can, 
can I tell a very brief anecdote about Yehuda in Berlin that related? Very brief. I went, really? Yehuda was my guest in Berlin when I was staying in Berlin three years ago, and I didn't know Yehuda spoke perfect German. He speaks perfect German. We went to the restaurant and he was like, Ich wollte etwas jetzt ganz anders. And I said, Yehuda, afterwards, you're speaking perfect German. You never told me you speak German. And he was quiet. He said, Daniel, why should I tell you that I speak this filthy language perfectly? <laughs> In other words, you can know something without showing that you know right. for various reasons. Right. Daniele, Daniele, you have mentioned you have mentioned this book about painters being man, considered as monkeys. Yes. So uh, I was going to ask Yehuda uh, about the uh, about the whether whether understanding can actually remove the mimicry. Hmm. Good question. If, mimic, if mimicry can be uh, can be something where you have the understanding that stays against it. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think I think that, that it's a very good question because it raises uh, uh, complex issues, uh, which has to do with uh, our behavior. Uh, and I think, in principle, yes. I think in principle the uh, mimicry can be much reduced by uh, uh, all sorts of devices uh, which have to do with uh, the mind uh, thinking independently of deep reality. You know, uh, the Greeks uh, were obviously divided in, in, in the view of language. Uh, this is why Kratulus, Kratulus, you know, in the in the dialogue called Cratylus, uh, Cratylus is the, the one who presents to Socrates with the idea that words have their meanings because they are mimicking the thing that they describe, you know, like plonk plonk for wine, you know, this is a clear case of mimicry. But Cratylus uh, had a stronger thesis. He wanted to argue that all language uh, derive its force from its uh, 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 mimicry characteristics. On, onomatopoetic. Yeah. Onomatope onomatopoeic, you know, and I, you know, when I was a school, a school boy, I was told that avoid onomatopoeic sounds, I was told. It's a very primitive, I was told. Avoid onomatopoeic sounds. And as I grew up and became somewhat of a writer, I realized that the reality is exactly the opposite. You know, the best writing always would have a large part of onomatopoeic. Now, the crucial question here is what? Onomatopoeic meaning like the sound of something, but the sound of what are you mimicking when you write? This is the issue, not whether you are mimicking or not. Of course you will mimic, and if you, you will do it unnoticeably or unaware, you will mimic the obvious things that people mimic. But if you are aware and you can make the mimicking as part of your technique, you can produce something ex extraordinary. And there is no extraordinary language without mimicking, without onomatopoeic. But the best onomatopoeic is the most surprising one, not only the most obvious one, like plonk, plonk. It's the really, when the language really mimics the music, the sound of certain uh, ambience, this is really a killer. And I think, you know, I took a chapter of James Joyce, Fannigan's Wake, and I translated it to Hebrew, not word for word, but sound, only by the sound. <laughs> and it did bring something out. Whatever it, it it was, it was not it was not meaningless. Do it like that. Is this Yehuda? Yehuda, Yehuda, is this linked to the Greek concept of ekphrasis? Do you think that uh, ekphrastic yeah. is a, a simile between the thing and the language used to describe it? Yeah, there are many ways to. Um, so there are many ways to to play with the language, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that the more ways that you uh, teach yourself, uh, 
the more you can get away from the simple mimic that uh, exists prima facie, you know. But since you mentioned Joy, uh, Joyce, then the, the other reference that Joyce was using, of course, was Vico about this. Well, of course. I mean, that's, what, that's also what, what, uh, what uh, Beckett discusses in this Dante, great Bruno, Vico, the, Joyce. Yeah. Dante dot 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 Bruno um, Vico Joyce. Bruno dot dot Vico dot Joyce. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> the great piece. There is a great piece. And there, again, there is the element of that sound, you know. But I think uh, that's exactly the answer to your question, uh, Dominique. Uh, that the, the mimic is, you know, it's given, right? It's given. And it's always tempting. It's almost, you know. Um, but because... kind of... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, go on. The Vico said, oh. uh, he spoke to your point about what is being imitated. Vico said in, in primitive culture, quote unquote, the primitive, uh, the archaic, uh, that they were imitating, the onomatopoetic was imitating the thunder and the light, you know, the explosions of volcanoes, uh, the meteorological uh, phenomena, and that gave rise to the names of the gods. That was his thesis, is that it's meteorological determinism to a certain degree. And the, the telluric as well as the, the weather, uh, because right. it's primordial right. experience. Yeah, it's also part of the given. Yeah, the given, yeah. And that's what Hermann Usener brought up in his book on Augenblicksgötter, that there were these gods of the moment. Right, right. Yeah. The FML. I think, and I think that uh, indeed that, uh, you know, the other difference between, uh, very important, between uh, Heidegger and uh, Husserl, I said that Husserl was more um, after the essence of things and Heidegger was more than existence. But from a point of view of language, you see, uh, Heidegger was really a kind of a poet. Uh, yeah. I would say that he is more of a poet than a philosopher. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, uh, Husserl was the opposite. By the way, I, I met people who went to his lectures, you know. To, to Heidegger's lectures? To Husserl lecture, there was his great poet oh, in uh, Jerusalem, from all places. A great poet from Jerusalem who wrote uh, uh, the first book on Karl Kraus, and I talked to him. He was a friend of a friend of mine, so I was introduced to him. And he went to the lecture of Husserl's, and he said that Husserl spoke beautifully. But when you read Husserl, you can't imagine him speaking beautifully because he writes like a mathematician. He writes, you know, mm. without sound, without any kind of sensibility, dry. sensitivity. Dry. to issues of language. Uh, mm. uh, and Heidegger is exactly the opposite. Mm. Never mind the logic, just listen to the sound. Mm. I mean, he's really great, great, great poet. Great mm. poet. Unfortunately, he sometimes thinks that his poetry is also philosophy, which I think mm. is a mistake. Mm. <laughs> that's... Uh, that's you know, over the years, I came to think like this more and more, realizing what, the shortcoming of uh, Heidegger, you know. Yehuda, what do you think yeah. of George Steiner's comparison, which I think is very strange, very forced, between Heidegger and Walter Benjamin on the Ursprung? You see, uh, I think I knew Steiner quite well, in fact. Yeah. And he warns me not to become like um, this great um, English oh. poet Coleridge. Coleridge, yeah. He thought that I should not waste my poetic gift and not uh, giving my, give myself too much to theory as opposed to creation, right? Hmm. 
and uh, I don't know if I listened or I didn't listen to him. I think in part I certainly did. He was a funny man. And uh, so his views are kind of strange because sometimes he writes about things he doesn't know. Like right. Yiddish, for example. Hmm. He, he found himself in a terrible mess because he claimed what he shouldn't have claimed because his knowledge of Yiddish was not sufficient. Yes. So what he says about, hmm. you see, it is uh, a priori true that uh, both of them were, as it were, uh, hmm. uh, sucking from the same source, flower. you know? Flower, yeah. Right. So in this respect, there's no doubt, mm. except that one was doing it from uh, a Jewish messianic perspective, and the other one was doing it with the Nibelung perspective. You know, <laughs> <that's> <laughs> and also from the ancient Greek pathos, yeah. Uh, man kann meinen, you know. Man kann meinen, yeah. Ancient Greek, as it is reflected in a dark mirror of, uh, right. of uh, Heidelberg uh, beer. Uh, beer hall. Well, it was not in Heidelberg. It was in Freiburg, even worse. You remember that book, Yehuda, of, of Butler called The Tyranny of Greece over Germany? Yes, 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 exactly. The Tyranny of Greece over Germany. Exactly. Yeah. It's not that really Greece. To, yeah. that, that what I said to Mr. Chipperfield, who became famous for having... Uh, recuperated one of the great museums in Berlin. And I said to Mr. Chippefield, you know, not in public, but privately. I, <laughs> I said, how could you, you know, do this thing again when the program proved itself completely inappropriate? The program I meant was, you know, in the 19th century, the German decided that if, if they had a great museum and great collection, especially of Greek art, then they will be like the Greek. But obviously that failed. Right? Mm -hmm. So what's the point of uh, recuperating the museum and re recuperating a, a program that proved itself totally inappropriate? <laughs> so, yeah, that's the difference between Heidegger and, uh, and Benjamin. One was a mensch and the other was a beast. So. <laughs> I ask, a, I, I, ask, he, I ask a very superficial question, but this, comes, this, this question comes to, to my mind because of, uh, uh, of Francis Ponch. Uh, and, uh, and what you're just saying about this stretch in Heidegger between poetry and philosophy. Right. Uh, in my creative method, he, he writes that he, uh, if I may quote, if, ide uh, that if ideas uh, disappoint me, give me no pleasure, it is because I offer them my approval too easily, seeing how they solicit it, it and uh, are only made for that. <laughs> Why is there uh, this difference, this unthinkable margin between the definition of a world and the description of the thing designated by the word? And my question is, how would you how would you perceive being a painter closer to being a philosopher or closer to being a poet? poet? <laughs> no question. What's the relation mind. between these two poles? Yeah, I think I think being a painter is much closer to poetry than philosophy. I think that um, that uh, uh, painting. Uh, at its best is poetry, and and uh, and the two are, have a lot in common in so many ways, and that's something that you couldn't say in the same way about uh, philosophy and uh, philosophers. You know, mm. philosophers uh, in a way have to guard themselves, and I think that the problem we have with Heidegger is that that he gave himself poetic license <laughs> in the mm. sense that he allowed himself to think what philosophically he should not have allowed himself to think. <laughs> <laughs> so Yehuda, you're close to Horace who said, ut pictura poesis, mm -hmm. like the poet, so the painter. Yeah, exactly. I completely agree, you know. Yes, and, and uh, Robert Klein pointed out in uh, La Forme et l'Intelligible that in the 16th century, the paintings of Titian and Giorgione were called poesie. They were called poets, poems, poems. Right. Because the Greek word poesis is simply to make. Yes. 
Yeah. It's a kind of form of making, you know. Yes. Um, no doubt. And, uh, and uh, Heidegger, indeed, he quotes Hedelin, and he says, uh, poetically dwell men on earth, you know. Yeah. Poeti poetically dwell men on earth. Well, that's, uh, that's it, right? Poetically dwell men on earth. By the way, in the same book that I read it, read it to you, Poetry, Language, and Thought, there is also uh, one of the articles is the thing, you know, the ding. The yeah. thing, yeah. The ding. It's one piece on ding and one piece of language. And I think also, you know, reading uh, Anna Arndt on Heidegger, she says something very similar to what I said about the fact that he was uh, such a gift, gifted with his language, you know, and seems not to... Uh, I think, you know, as a philosopher, I think he uh, failed us in many ways, but not as a poet. But, but Yehuda, you not be responsible to whatever he says. Yehuda, you once reminded me that uh, you that uh, in England in the seventies, uh, uh, Hannah Arendt was called a metaphysical journalist, not a philosopher. <laughs> yeah, some philosopher did call her, but uh, nevertheless, she knew him very well. Uh, she knew him too well. Uh, Some people say too well. I say that. A lot of people say that. Adorno could never forgive her for that. He didn't think it was too well. You know. Poetically meant well. This is, this is the line from Elderly that, uh, that Heidegger. So poetically, I think that is true. And in that sense, uh, the poet and the painter have much more in common than, uh, than the philosopher. Is it about forgetting a language? About forgetting yourself within the learning language or resisting the language that you're actually applying as a painter? Oh, well, allowing, allowing the language to speak for itself, you know, mm. and, uh, and not... But uh, actually losing, losing its, its con the consciousness of the language, like forgetting the story. It's like I... The, the, like this Kafka story about about the swimmer who happened to be the best swimmer uh, because he forgot how to swim. Right. That is right. Right. But that's right. right. The point. The point is not necessarily. Uh, mm. There's a nice play by Chapek, you know, about it, it's a kind of accident. Yeah. And everybody's interview uh, was the car, and nobody remember. And then they interviewed this poet, and he said, "Well, I I don't remember anything, the number of the car, nothing. But listen, I did write something. Perhaps in that you will find it." And he gives them a poem, and in the poem, there's an orchestra, and the way the orchestra is described gives them all the numbers that make the car number. It's a play by Karl Chapek. Mm -hmm. But D Dominique, that reminds me, and I think Yehuda and I have discussed this, of the theory of play of, of Schiller mm -hmm. and of Roger Caillois, very different uh, thinkers, but the idea that once you enter into the play realm, the realm of the ludus or the play, you, you're not aware that you're playing, you're just doing it. Yeah, well, like in Homo Ludens itself. Homo Ludens of Heusinger, yeah. So Which, in a way, uh, I would say that the super, the super category of painting and art and poetry is play in that regard, I would suggest tentatively. Which is not philosophy, you know, philosophy no. is uh, more difficult and more restricted. More formal. I think in the case of Heidegger, he suddenly overlooked these uh, uh, strictures. But Heidegger wrote about Nietzsche and he Nietzsche was, uh, people, analytic philosophers who I disagree with attack Nietzsche, saying he's not a philosopher, he's a literary figure. Do you think that there's that link too between the no, Nietzschean? I think, I think Nietzsche was much more of a philosopher than Heidegger. Right, I, I agree. But that also a poet. Not immediately, but in the perspective of another 50 years, <laughs> that will become clear. Heidegger I just, I just have to add something. Sorry, the um, and it's beautiful to have um, Dominic Yehuda and Daniel and everybody else uh, in this discussion. 
um, I, I find this, um, you know, you guys are so fascinated by history of historical documents. Like, you know, who said what, who said what to whom. Right, right. La, la, la. And, uh, and I think for me, you know, to get out of this meeting, because I have to actually move on, is, is um, you know, question to Dominic, is that, you know, how do we question reality or, or even future today with, with so much uh, pressure on being based on documents? Uh, I mean, we know that uh, so many people, many right wing, are actually not interested in documents at all. And, but there are, there, are, there are many of them. And then, you know, if you think about painting or think about, you know, architecture or design, you know, I'm just curious how to get out of this discussion, <laughs> thinking that, you know, this, all of this documentation or revision of documentation can, can just move on. There's well, you know, my you, question. Your, your question is excellent, and there are many attempts, none completely successful, to answer it. Obama, the other day, published a text in which he described it as the epistemological problem. And it's funny because <laughs> yes. I've been invited to participate in a kind of colloquium on, on the climate issue, and I still have it on my desk here, you know. And I wrote a paper, you know, I actually wrote a paper. Huh? Hmm. And what was the title? The title was Epistemological Ambiguity, I call it. <laughs> Just two weeks before Obama. <laughs> and it was exactly about that. It was, how is it that people are so happy and ready to ignore anything that knowledge can provide them with and behave exactly against their best interests. Yes. How is it possible? Yes. You know, it turned out that 85% of people don't take the, the medicine that was prescribed to them. Right. <laughs> they don't take it, 85%. So, well, 75 only, maybe. I'm making it up? No, I heard it. <laughs> so, I think, what is the answer? I think I have one answer. It's not a very good one. But, you know, if you think of Meno, do you remember Meno? You know, as a mathematician, it would appeal to you, this dialogue called Meno. What's Meno. going on there? Meno. Meno is a, is a provincial governor who comes to Athens for his uh, home kind of uh, break. And there he goes to Socrates and asks him for advice. How would he exercise his his authority in a better way, more just. And so Socrates' question and answer point out to him that in order to, to be more just, he have to have the, a better understanding of what ju being just consists in. And so he asked him, Socrates asked Meno, whether his boy had any tuition. And Meno says, no, 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 my boy had no tuition, no teaching, nothing at all. And then Socrates draw in the sand a square and ask the boy to enlarge the square, double the square. And the boy, of course, start with a obvious kind of construction. Hmm. Question, answer, question, answer. And finally, you know the answer, yes? There's the square. And finally, he does a diagonal on which he will just work. <laughs> and this is a beautiful allegory for the power of rational judgment. Because mm -hmm. the idea is that every human being, no matter, is born with a capacity for rational judgment. Right. And if this is true, then we have hope. Limited. But we have hope. Because the idea is that even people are completely drenched with their silly kind of belief or whatever, there is a reason behind it. There is the capacity to exercise that 
rational judgment, if you only get there, <laughs> and the question, of course, is how to get there, you know, how to make them face with their own ability to judge and let them, let, let, let them find out the discrepancy between what they know, potentially, and what they think they know, which is false. So, yeah. Surgeon, Foucault said about 40 years ago, the challenge of our time is to convert the document into the monument. In other okay. words, <laughs> get away from the document, seeing it as a monument. And I would also suggest, if you are trying to move on, there's a danger of falling into anti-intellectualism, saying, ah, we don't need to know the past, we don't need to know documents. You can listen to this idea of rationality and of conversion towards the visual or towards the monument and still be interested in what other people have said in the past. You don't have to- <clears throat> Daniel, I didn't mean that. I mean- I know, I'm, I'm, I'm just being provocative. You, yeah, yeah, that's okay. Because you you're said you're throwing a bomb. I just didn't mean that. Of course, you know, the other monument is- No, I didn't mean to take it the wrong way. It's all right. The problem, the, the problem, the problem clearly is uh, that it is not easy to find a situation in which people uh, will change their mind. I mean, we had the yes. Second World War, we had a terrible thing, and yet we have a neo-Nazi in, uh, in uh, the White House. Germany and in the White House, in, in Italy, uh, everywhere, and in France. So that is clearly the case, that the people are not particularly impressed uh, by what is the case, because they're not interested in what is the case. <laughs> they are more interested in their fantasies, mm. and they are more uh, ready to live up to their yeah. fantasy than anything that uh, will disprove it. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, you could uh, just add to that, uh, I think uh, the Western European angst is bad. You know, the, the, yeah. <clears throat> the reality which is not bearable by the very same people who are in that reality. I mean, yeah. just take the question. I was invited to apply for a director at Bauhaus in Dessau. Wow. And I'm, I'm asking around people and they're being discouraging me not to do it because, you know, right wing politics and sucks for me and, and all the la la la, you know, but, uh, but the, how to say, the germ is here. And uh, I think, how come, you know, what do we do next? You know, what is the, I mean, you, European schools, <clears throat> talking about Europe, talking about Dominic also about, you know, the future of Poland. And, um, you know, they, they had an edge at some time, especially in the 80s and the 90s. You had the Berlache Institute and there was Jan Van Eyck, which still exists. Mm. Yehuda no, used to teach nobody, them. Yeah. Nobody's there. And uh, so, you know, like, how, how can that be continued? And uh, where can it be? Well, Jan, for example, Jan van Eyck is only because this area was Catholic, you know. Interesting. <laughs> you, you know, Yehuda, for a secular Jew, sometimes I think you sound like a Catholic. <laughs> well, if I had to be something, <laughs> I'd rather be Catholic than anything else, you know. <laughs> it means universal in Greek, Catholicos. Yeah. Catholicos, exactly. And you told me the story about Monteverdi. Was agree, it Monteverdi? You know, it, 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 was it that the story about the word Catholic and the music of, was it Monteverdi? I can't remember. Palestrina. The Pope said, what is that music? Remember you said that story? I can tell the story. It's a very interesting story, typical of the Catholic Church. You know that, uh, <laughs> that uh, in the process of the Counter Reformation, they have the Council of Trent, where the, all the cardinals met to decide what was Catholic, what is not, and they decided that uh, <clears throat> they will do it uh, empirically. So <laughs> they said, "Very So now bring the musician in. The musician came in, and the the Cardinal instructed them to play, pay, uh, play Monteverdi. So the musician played Monteverdi, 
the cardinal were listening, and then we start whispering to each other, isn't it great? Must be Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> when I start well. writing, I start writing about art and architecture. <laughs> I decided <laughs> to apply the same technique. That is to say, that if I see a work of art or I see a uh, architecture that uh, mm. that I think is very good, then I say, well, <laughs> it's Catholic. So I write about it. If not. <laughs> So well, you, in this ahead. situation, Yehuda, I'm, I'm definitely a Roman Catholic atheist. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there if was, I'm not going to be an atheist, I, I have to be Roman Catholic atheist. <laughs> there was also that book, uh, Yehuda, that you mention all the time called The Non-Jewish Jew. <laughs> By, um, um, Isaac Deutscher, so there's the, you're the non-Catholic Catholic, and he was the non-Jewish Jew. Right. Not non-Catholic Catholic, but non-Catholic atheist. Uh, 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 no, or Catholic atheist. Yeah, no, universal. Yeah, yeah, Roman Catholic atheist. But that's but even better. Before you atheist, you know that uh, Russell took part, Bernard Russell, the philosopher, took part in anti, uh, anti uh, nuclear demonstration. In one of them, he was uh, arrested by the police. And in the police, the police officer asked him uh, address and uh, age, occupation, uh, and then religion. And Russell said, uh, atheist. So the policeman said, what is this? And Russell said, well, just another religion. <laughs> okay, that's amazing. Yehuda, yeah, guys, Dominic, I really do have to leave for another meeting. And uh, I'd like to speak to Dominic yeah. when you can. Definitely, I'll see you. I see you, Sirjan, in Berlin. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be there end of February. Wonderful. Yeah, Yehuda, thank you so much. As always, you know. The Virginia. And Daniel, of course, and everybody else. Ciao, ciao. Thank you, Sirjan. Ciao. Thank you. Oh, Drew oh. is here. Okay. So what is your program? Are we ending now? Well, this is, this is, uh, this is something, Yehuda, which I would like to postpone indefinitely. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. But I know our, I, I know you, 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 probably it's a, it's a question of a capacity of yours and the, and your generosity in general, because I, I will be very happy to, to carry on for, for the rest of the evening. <laughs> right. uh, right. I can, I can um, uh, one thing I could, I could uh, do is like to uh, pay, the, pay, pay my, my official duty to, to end the, the talk, but then we could just carry on later on. So I could just few the, say those few things uh, now. And then maybe we could just have a discussion as long as you you okay. you, you like, okay. of course. <laughs> okay. It was a wonderful wonderful experience. Thank and you. Uh, I, uh, uh, Daniela, is it possible that I have Yehuda in a big frame and not you lying in the sofa because I cannot concentrate now? Oh, I have well, I'm, your major I'm, image. To be that way because of a problem with my bookcase. And I would like, I, instead of you, I would like to have a Yehuda. In can, the, you see, in, can you see? I, I cut off my. Yeah, but leaf. it doesn't change anything. Yehuda is still in a small frame. I have a kind of anong warum. Warum? I have to. And I, I get in the. Oh, screen, yes. You know. Oh, that's it. Yehuda. It's not because of the Odalisk, it's because of Yehuda's framing. <laughs> Although I, I like being described as an Odalisk. <laughs> well, you exactly post like that. So, I can't uh, help it because uh, my bookcases are now yeah. being Ye coming Ye into the room. Yeah. Ye Yehuda, uh, I would like I would like to to thank you so much for for this meeting or for for this lecture. And it, I think it exactly exactly appeared to me as uh, as a, as something which we I think we're all striving for in this in this uh, this uh, time of of the physical. Um, uh, uh, engagement <laughs> uh, uh, 
that we we happen to have the time where where, where the thoughts uh, and and uh, are in a, in a, in a closer proximity thanks to you and uh, and I was very happy I'm very happy that we could share it with the crowd of my students your thoughts our discussion um, it really makes me feel uh, very very uh, much touched of the whole situation and uh, and thank you so much for this lecture. Thank you for, so much for sharing your thoughts. And uh, and um, uh, that's all what I can really say. I'm very happy and, and I, I'm very grateful for, for the whole situation, for your talk, for sharing your, your thoughts, uh, which I would say initiates the the series of uh, of the next week of the next meetings and the and the, uh, and the, the greatest way I can imagine. <laughs> I'm very happy. <laughs> well, thank you so much for the invitation. It was a pure pleasure. I was very happy and uh, also to meet other people that I have not seen for a long time, Sergio <laughs> and Mark. Yeah. And uh, let's hope that we can continue on another occasion. Okay. Right? Yeah. Uh, well, my, my, my students remained in silence, which was taken over by your all, all, older students. But I'm sure that yeah. they took a lot out of this, uh, uh, out of this lecture. I so they can, they can still ask me any question now because I'm still on it and I could be on it for a while. Yes, uh, happily. So uh, to the students, if any of you ask in any language, including Polish, please ask. <laughs> Are there any, any more questions for Yehuda now? Yes, please ask if you like to raise any issue, ask any question in any language you like, not in Chinese. Chinese, <laughs> Chinese would be my daughter. Really? Be oh, not bad, yeah, it's wise to learn Chinese now. Because she goes, she goes to the I Kita, Chinese, I German. <laughs> German. I've been teaching Chinese in the summer before, you know, for the entire summer, but uh, for a month, but there was always somebody translating, so. <laughs> do you want to ask a question? Uh, I do have a question. Yes, please. Hi. Uh, I'm calling from Los Angeles, <laughs> and I was very interested in your, um, your comment about the um, the physiologic explanation of mirror neurons not adding to the knowledge of empathy. I was very curious if you could expand on that uh, topic, please. Yeah, uh, you know, on the face of it, once this discovery was uh, made, uh, you felt that perhaps now we will have to revise whatever has been written over centuries on the question of empathy. You know, empathy, after all, is a Greek invention, you know, the Greek noticed this uh, phenomenon. Uh, the German, again, as usual, they translate it into German. They, in German, you don't say empathy, you say Einfühlung, which is a, a different word. Einfühlung is feeling at one. So one thought originally when this news came out, uh, one thought that it will change the discourse. But I realized after a few years of following the discussion, in fact, it didn't. It didn't change at all the discourse because our understanding of what empathy is uh, curiously was not at all impacted by these discoveries. The problem remained exactly the same. Mm -hmm. The only difference was that by now we had some better understanding of the physiology that goes with it. But knowing the physiology did not really uh, solve as it as it were the the enigma of what it is and what makes it what it is etc etc mm -hmm. that was very interesting lesson that's all i can say to you yeah i was just wondering from the physiologic perspective if it had any kind of therapeutic implications and i'm sure there are but i don't know much about it i do know that some people thought that they could uh, work out autism on the basis of uh, this uh, physiology, but uh, their hopes to uh, affect uh, our understanding of uh, autism was not 
completely revolted in the sense that that uh, nothing much um, could follow this uh, hypothesis. So there were several such ideas, but as far as I know, nothing really came out of it. Mm, thanks. There's an interesting comment made about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, in taking over the field of medicine and providing a lot of the uh, kind of algorithmic thinking behind the medicine, medicine's approach to uh, problems, and that the role of the physician in the future with AI would be providing empathy. That would be their sole role. <laughs> uh, that's a nice idea. Except that, you know, like all of these ideas, uh, they are good ideas and they might have application up to the point, but one okay. could not think of them as a kind of absolute, you know? Of course. Meaning that, yeah, you could do a lot with uh, artificial intelligence. You could do a lot with uh, providing doctors with such uh, intelligent assistance, but I think you need them for more than empathy. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. you know, ultimately, will never be replaced by anything. All right. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the things that uh, create such an impression in the world was the the colossal uh, event when the, when the computer won the chess game. Casper. Remember this? Uh, Casper. Yeah, that was that that was a really uh, game changer in so far as. Uh, until then, uh, one felt that uh, we are kind of secured from the mm. being overrun by uh, machine. AI. Mm. Right. And once this happened, that was really uh, hard to uh, overcome. But I, I, I belong to those people who, uh, even with this in great success of AI, it just mm. shows the limit of the game. It just shows that the chess is... Uh, is no more than uh, the AI can do. Well, <laughs> that's good news. <laughs> it just means that chess is no longer the threshold. It's no longer the uh, the ideal, right? It just show. It just put chess in its place as a very, very mm. interesting game. But a game, you know, <laughs> mm. Mm. no mm. more than a game. And by the way, there's a, quite a literature over this, over time about exactly that, about chess players, you know, who were very good in chess, but nothing else, you know. <laughs> there was a story like this by Stefan Zweig, for example. Mm -hmm. In my high class, you know, I went to a rather special kind of school, like MIT junior high school. And among us, there was a fellow, one of our students' fellow, who would play simultaneously against all of us. We were about 25 students. And we would sit, each one of us, with our own chessboard and everything. And he would turn his back to us and looking at the blackboard. And everyone in his turn would say what move he did, and he would say what move he did. And he would win against all of us. But, you know, that was the only thing he was so good at. Everything else, mathematics, uh, he was like any one of us. Nothing special, except the game. There you are. Please, any question, any comments? Drew is saying something. Drew, we cannot hear you. You have to switch oh, you on your hear me? Now, can you? Drew? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No? Because Drew, you're trying to say something and I, I cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. Nobody's asking anything? No, Drew is trying to say something, I see. Or not. Oh, okay. Please. Please. No, but we cannot, it doesn't work. Who is trying to speak? Is the, the woman I see called Arch? 
Aki, Aki? No, she's not. She, I don't know. Agnieszka, yes, what, what is appetized? But I, I see that <clears throat> there is another. Uh, Drew Ham. Dominiku, Dominiku, niech Drew poprosi o, no, no, no. Uh -huh. o, o wyłączenie tego wyciszenia. Drew? Yeah, because Drew has, he has something with microphone. He has microphone off. Um. Is he, is he got a... Uh, he, he, Drew, your microphone is off. Your microphone is off. Can you hear us? Maybe you can type. Send him a message. Uh, Pavle, on, the left of, on the left side of the pic, of, of this, this, um, there is there is a panel with microphone on the left side of uh, Zoom. Um, uh, but maybe you need to ask you. me to unmute because I didn't. I can do it. Pavel? Yes? Coś, nie wiem, czy coś można z Drew jakoś można, wysłać wiadomo? Można, tylko on musi po... Już jest. Już jest okej. Okay. Okay. Tak, już nie ma wyłączonego mikrofonu. Okej. Okay. Moment. Drew, no ma znowu wyłączone. Znowu. Okay. Może do niego zadzwonię. Mm -hmm. Ja tego nie mogę zrobić z mojej pozycji. No teraz co? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. yes. Finally. It was my phone. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> But you can hear me now. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Well, I was only going to say uh, thanks to you. Uh, but we managed to come out and then rejoin and then it asked the proper questions to Uh, use the computer audio, so it seems to have made some improvement. But I was going to ask that I was to say that I was very glad that you brought up the matter of the burning bush because this episode, this story, is very important to Aquinas because at this moment uh, uh, Moses asks God, "Who should I say that you are?" And he says, "I am who I am." And from this response. Aquinas derives his distinction between essence and existence, which of course is an Aristotelian distinction, but here he uses it to say that this is God's way of saying essence and existence are one in me. So this becomes Aquinas's definition of God, to say the only creature or the only being in whom essence and existence are one. So the in whom the quo est existence, that which something is, and the quod est, that by which something is, the essence, it's one. And I was hoping that this might return us to Husserl, who makes this distinction between the noetic perception and the noematic perception. So if I recall, then the noetic which he illustrates by reference to the story of seeing a tree. The noetic would be that which we most immediately perceive about the tree, that it has a certain bilateral symmetry with green leaves and a brown trunk, these sorts of features. 
and the nomadic have to do with aspects of the tree that might re interest more someone like Freud or Lacan, namely all the associations we might have with that tree because perhaps we might have a memory of our father bringing us to that tree when we were a child and what the world was like at that time in our memory and all the associations that it might have. So it, it occurred to me that perhaps there could be an analogy between this idea of essence and existence and these, this, this distinction of Husserl between a noetic and a nomadic perception of things. And this of course uh, is I think perhaps related to Dominic's question about painting that uh, painting in some sense, on the one hand does have this immediacy, which uh, as Yehuda pointed out is analogous to poetry. And yet it does also entail a degree of self-conscious reflection. So I, I bring this up because it occurred to me that the, the way you structured the conversation Seem, it seemed to come full circle in a way from, the, um, uh, from Husserl uh, to the burning bush and then back to Husserl, at least through analogy. I hope I'm making sense. Yes, I think that you made perfect sense. I think that uh, uh, I brought up the distinction between existence and, and uh, essences in relation to, to uh, Husserl and uh, Heidegger and uh, pointing out that Heidegger seems to have in some sense abandoned the, the philosophical ambition of uh, Husserl in so far as his most important work being in time, he uh, uh, seems to have uh, advanced an existential thesis, right? And therefore also from a point of view of temporality, he is uh, accepting uh, more, what do you say, traditional uh, forms of temporality, uh, in view of history. Yes, both he mentioned Marx, he mentioned Diltai, and he mentioned other people. So he, in this case, he became much more, I would say, conventional in his understanding of time, compared with Husserl, who gave a lecture under the title The Phenomenology of Internal Time Consciousness, which, in which he suggested a very different conception of time, uh, which was more phenomenologically in the Husserlian way understood yeah. as something that we are capable of uh, making it up ourselves, you know. And I think that's very, uh, not only it's very true, it's very important for us in art, in paintings, in architecture to understand the degree to which, you know, in, to which time, like distance, are elastic. The mm -hmm. concept that we make up as we go along. <laughs> and that we are capable of uh, internal time consciousness. That's is a great, mm -hmm. I think, great, great insight. It's quite ironic because it was Heidegger who actually edited these lectures that came out as internal time consciousness. But it seemed that he, yes, that he had the capacity and the, he did a very good job in editing these lectures, but it, did, it seemed to me that uh, maybe having done that uh, also made him free of the lesson that it were. He doesn't seem to take the lesson very much to heart at all. A German philosopher of his generation could never really get away from the historicists. Right. Well, that's what happened, you know, that Heidegger did not get away from anything like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, Husserl did write in German, but he was not German in any sense of the word, except that he wrote in German. That was his, uh, I think, my view, uh, misfortune. 
and uh, from people I knew, uh, he, he spoke very well, but he wrote, you know, 25,000 uh, pages uh, in his archive in Novan, mm. because according to his uh, kind of uh, theoretical insight, he had to rewrite everything that other people have written, in the sense that he had to rethink everything, scientifically, mathematically, anthropologically, psychologically, and so on. <laughs> uh, that was a, a mammoth task. Mm -hmm. So, I think that I have read a relatively small fraction of what he has written. But not only he has written so much, but most of what he has written is terribly kind of, you know, a uh, little bit of uh, his own kind of jargon, you know? It's not jargon in the sense of repeating what other people said, but his own. <laughs> it's a very difficult language, unfortunately. But I think he had a great insight. And uh, even those who deviate, like uh, Heidegger, still learn a lot from him. <laughs> That's, of course, part of the irony. And yes, I am, uh, I'm glad that you brought the uh, San Aquinas, and, uh, because you see the, the theory of uh, empathy, that uh, the theory of intentionality that, uh, that really um, started also on, on his, uh, on his uh, track, started with uh, the medieval understanding of intentionality, you know. Mm -hmm. How is it possible that uh, that I can internalize in our, in my mind something that is out there? Mm. That is the real trick. <laughs> mm. And how do we understand this capacity? You know, this capacity to um, appreciate something out there and mm. to transform it into internal object. That is uh, that. These puzzles still remain. I don't think it will ever be uh, solved. Mm. Mm. And I think that puzzle has a lot to do with what we do as uh, as painters or mm. architects. You know, we are constantly mm. have to. Um, well, we are not always aware that you know that, that there is a kind of intentional act involved. Mm. But this is what it is: mm. intentional. Mm. And so a theory of intentionality is uh, it's essential if you mm. are going to have any mm. understanding mm. of the possibility of projecting, mm. externalizing something mm. from the interior and interiorizing, mm. interiorize something from the outside. Mm. It's not possible to Mm. appreciate it and to understand it without some kind of some theory of intentionality mm. and that was the beginning of uh, Husserl terminology mm. and that also Great. in my to my mind also explained why he was so much more uh, much better known in the in the in the catholic world than mm. in the <laughs> anglo-saxon Protestant, mm. yeah. By the way, Heidegger himself was Catholic. He actually was born not very far from uh, mm. Freiburg in the Black, mm. Black Forest, which, as you know, is not far from the beginning of the two great river of uh, that part mm. of Europe, you know, the Rhine and the Danube. Mm. The Rhine start not far from Zurich in Schaffhausen, mm. goes west, and just a little bit north of it, mm. not very oh, far, no, mm. the Danube South in Donau Eschingen, you know, which mm. is a, a, a great music festival, Donau Eschingen. Mm. <laughs> so you have this yes. knowledge of San, San Aquinas because you went to Catholic school or something like this? I did. Mm. Well, well. And also, I, I spent a lot of time with a friend who was a philosopher of intention, who was G.E.M. Anscombe at Cambridge. 
Oh, really? I did not graduate Cambridge. I went to Columbia, but I knew her quite well. Really? Yeah. Yeah, she's That's... more a kind of Wittgenstein follower. Yeah. Yes, she became his literary his literary executrix. Hmm. Exactly. Very well, interesting. This is all. This is all. Also, I think the, it, it, what you just draw onto, drew in the reference to the the optical. I mean, the Catholicism somehow, to my mind, is also the question of the of the optical structure. And I think what what's happening for 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 me, for for example, now what I think is that. Speaking of the Catholicism in Poland, I, I don't think so. It's a Catholicism. Uh, it's, it's a pagan version of Catholicism, which I think Maria Rajanian was writing this about very strongly. Speaking of of the uh, of the certain type of self-colonizing uh, by the uh, not necessarily the Catholics. I wouldn't say that the P Polish National Church at the moment is a Catholic church. It's something completely different. But this is a the digression. I think the, the digression to something which I was, and this would be like, the, I promise Yehuda, because of the time and probably your exhaustion, it would be the last question from my side, is that would you consider the confusion that also Srijan was uh, asking about uh, in a contemporary uh, situation, of course, the, the internalizing the, uh, the, the outside, whether we may deal with something which is merely a, an optical problem in terms of the way how the perspective, perspective as, a, as, a, as a tool was a sort of an order to understand the world. Now we're dealing with completely the, the conflict of the pers 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 perspective in the world. And even in the way how we communicate now, it's a sort of something against the Renaissance perspective. We on a we all on a on a flat plane, and I was recently wondering whether this may cause the actual this 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 may be actually the cause of many problems now. Speaking of the politics, speaking of all sorts of uh, so, uh, the way how people perceive the fantasy and the reality on a flat plane, whether, whether you would have any reflections about that that the perspective problem and the optical problem that we're dealing with now may actually cause all those side effects as you could as you could uh, think of in terms of the way of uh, internalizing what's outside around us well it's a it's a it's a very interesting to consider it i never thought about it too much but uh, you know a priori, it seemed to me that uh, after a few generations of people who have been affected so much by the by the flatness uh, of, as you say, the lack of perspective uh, in in yeah in watching their life uh, unfolding on on a on a flat screen, <laughs> uh, it's definitely possible that you would lose perspective. I don't know. And the irony, of course, is that that aspiration to flatness was mm -hmm. created by post-war painting in New York. <laughs> yes, that's true. It was created by post. Uh, you see, I think that it has to do with a much bigger problem of uh, temporality, you see. I think that temporality, uh, in well-balanced society, temporality is something that individuals share with the collective and there is no great, as it were, break, no antagonism between your own internal time consciousness and the collective time. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 19th century, this uh, kind of harmony or coexistence was uh, breaking down mm -hmm. in the sense that individuals could no longer identify their own temporality with the collective one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how that is you can see it in paintings in the late 19th century when the when the when the surface become more and more important mm -hmm. it's precisely related to that i think and mm -hmm. then you have freud you have proust mm -hmm. la recherche de time perdu you have bergson you have husserl you have abi barbo you have einstein all mm -hmm. these people invent their own time mm -hmm. it never happened before mm -hmm. and so 
the result is that uh, many, many more people, well, the larger uh, public, knowingly or unknowingly, was beginning to lose that cohesive relationship between internal time and external time, between your own internal time consciousness and the collective time which you share with other people. That what happened. What is still happening, yeah? We don't have uh, a, a simple uh, solution to that, but you can see that in, obviously, in the art, it's very obvious that people produce their own time capsule, you know? Mm. Like, uh, uh, like Freddy Kiesler, for example, in his uh, Endless House, like, uh, uh, like uh, Merz, you know, the Schwitters. Uh, 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 the Merzbau. Mm -hmm. Merzbau is exactly that. He built his own kind of cocoon. And if you look at uh, Bancusi in, in his studio in Paris, it's like uh, he lived in the middle of Paris. He lived like he was a peasant in the Carpathian Mountains. Why? To keep his own time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And you can see it in the in the endless column. People look at it spatially, but it's not spatially; it's temporary. It's mm -hmm. a pattern in time. This mm -hmm. tack 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 tack, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I think that is a, even a stronger than just a loss of perspective, as mm -hmm. as you uh, suggested, Dominic. I think what you are saying, I think, is perfectly true and probably part of it. But I think the larger uh, thing is to do with the uh, Time is the experience of time. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't we don't have a collective time in, mm -hmm. in any uh, earlier sense, mm -hmm. you know. Whether it was uh, the mm -hmm. church bell in the middle of the community, or whether it was whatever it was that kept this uh, communal time, it's no longer uh, does no longer apply. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. The South Americans would love you for this. Really? Well, because Why? almost all South American literature is about time. Uh, yeah. well, because of the same reason. I mean, they have their own time. You know, they had to break up from the authority of uh, church and other kind of institutions. And I think that's why they're obsessed with time, because they wanted to have their own time, you know? <laughs> The shortest short story ever written is by. I mean, sorry. The shortest yeah. short story ever written is by a Honduran called Monterroso, and the short story is this: When he awoke, the dinosaur was still there, which of course has a treatment of time and the fact that it's a very short length of the story itself is very important. <laughs> Just that when he woke up. The dinosaur, when you woke up, the dinosaur was still there. <laughs> Interesting. And Borges uh, always is echoing Shakespeare because his um, education was English. So he uses the to be or not to be. He says, to be with you or not to be with you, that is the measure of my time. <laughs> and Alejo Carpentier says, um, uh, to go down, to go back down the Orinoco River is to go back in time. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> And yet, you know, we are using this uh, calendar, which is based on the approximate, approximated date of Jesus' birth. Yeah. <laughs> probably out of six, by about 36, 37 years. Huh? <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> the French Revolution wanted, you know, not only standard of meter, they also wanted to turn the calendar, calendar into a metric system. <laughs> and so we would have hundred years uh, and uh, we have uh, hundred minutes in an hour and we have uh, 10 hours uh, and so on, but they never succeeded. It would be interesting. <laughs> they only succeeded in the meter, 
you know. And <laughs> still now, if you go to the museum in uh, Sevres, outside Paris, they have the standard of the meter, which is a bronze with yeah. X section, uh, a bronze uh, meter. <laughs> so maybe it's time to change, time to create uh, a new time. Post uh, COVID, huh? <laughs> Post the pandemic. Slightly <laughs> <laughs> shorter days, you know. Shorter month. Now you, now you, your words, your the precious words disappeared. For some reasons, I cannot hear you, Yehuda. Okay. Do you hear me now? Now, yes. No, I was just Something. saying that perhaps it's time to change time, you know, to create different <laughs> kind of time. Shorter yeah. days, you know, slightly shorter days to have yeah. a year, not necessarily on the full cycle, to have declare a year <laughs> every three months or something. <laughs> to give life different so days, especially mm. now after the pandemic. So maybe that's that's the that's the that's the that's the um, the actual role of uh, painting to change the time as much as the role to change the space would be a poetry. You're right. You're right. I think successful painting changes time in the sense that uh, time is never the same. When a successful painting occurs, okay, huh? you see it from that perspective, and that means that you see things differently. Mm. I think a successful painting is the one which has its own time. Mm. I think, yes, it's very important to say that every painting, in my view, has its own field of time. Mm. You know, if it doesn't, it's a kind of secondary painting because it then it means that it depends on some other painting for its sense of time. But a painting that is completely successful must have its own field of time, in my view. I mean, you know, I mean, take for example, if you look at Agnes Martin painting, you know, this kind of endless lines, one beside the other, right? And if you put it in a room and the other side of the room, you put, I don't know, Barnett Newman. Mm. But it's obviously, it's a different time. It's, mm. it's a different field of time. The one in which the division is so detailed and so small suggests totally different experience of time than the one in which you have rights of colors and just one or two contrast. Totally different. Yeah, maybe. Indeed, even within, you know, the sublime, even within the sublime, if you look at uh, Clifford Steele painting and you look at the uh, Rothko painting, well, they're both sublime, but you know, it's like <laughs> as if they're not speaking to each other. Mm. They're totally different world mm. in temporal mm. terms, right? In temporal terms. So maybe that's the, that's, and, that would be the new, the, 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 the way to, to start questioning painting rather than in terms of time, rather than in terms of the space. Maybe the space is more, actually related to poetry, paradoxically, the, yeah. then uh, the painting is related to space. May, the painting may be more related to time. Uh, uh, I think so, because I think that between, the, between the two intuition of time and space, mm. there is a priority. I think that the temporal intuition is uh, more important and more dominant than the spatial one. Mm. You experience space in terms of the temporality with which you walk into it. Mm. And you can, if you want to ex express it, you can express it, for example, with sound, with music, with word, with sound. You can express that temporality mm. with which you walk into a space. But what if you find ultimately the space is not the space in itself, but the temporality with which you experience that space. I think that is very, very important. Very important.
I can no more agree. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, so maybe. I would like. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I would like to thank you very much for Professor Yehuda. Thank you very much for this beautiful evening for me. Also, Dominique. Thank you, Alberto. Um, I have to leave you because I have small son and he is waiting for me. So um, it was a big experience for me and really, really um, very, very important evening. Thank you. Thank Ciao you. to everybody. Hi. <laughs> bye bye. bye. Yeah. So, how do you say, Dominique? Dziękuję uh, bardzo. That's a perfect uh, way of expressing. <laughs> Yehuda, bardzo dziękuję. Uh, I, I've heard it. Yes, słyszałam. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękujemy bardzo wszyscy. Thank you. Dziękuję jeszcze raz. It was a it was a wonderful time. And uh, okay. now she created something. <laughs> I I'm very happy that we can all spend and share this this precious time with you. I didn't know I had so many grown up, grown up students in my studio and so well <laughs> informed. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm, I I would like to thank you and everybody and and especially Yehuda for this for this uh, very special for me evening. Well, thank you. It was a great pleasure to get to know you and. Uh... Let us continue another time. And with another your permission, uh, since my mother is in New York, she just turned 90 and I will certainly visit her sooner or later. Then uh, when I'm in New York, I I'm hoping very much to be able to at least have a glass of wine with you. No, oh, sure. I would be happy to meet you. <laughs> and I will ask uh, Dominic for, for your contact. The Aquinas. <laughs> I would very much like to join you too. I hope that will be a moment in the, in the world that, that, that we, we would have the chance to actually uh, right. hear the sound of the, of the glasses uh, clicking each other. <laughs> right. right. So, Dominique, you can give him my address and telephone number and so on. I surely will. So. I'm, I'm very happy that this uh, apparently, uh, lecture for only for my mostly for my student happened to be also the the chance to to connect people I I admire. <laughs> okay, very good. Yehuda, thank you. Uh, bye bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Then I say good night to both of you, and I look forward to seeing you both. <laughs> okay. Yes. Bye. 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 Thank well. you so much for the great lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. Thank you.